Hi everybody. I know it's been over a year since I made another video, but there's a bunch of stuff that has happened to me in between this time. First of all, my computer died. Here, take a look. Yep, Freddy Krueger slashed my computer. So in addition to downloading all the clips, all the pictures, and all the software again, I also had to rewrite the entire script from the beginning. The entire script could not be recovered. I'm also in the process of digitizing all my old videotapes and DVDs to my computer. The progress right now is pretty far ahead, but I still have a long way to go. I've done almost 200 trades in the past 20 years. And as you can see, it really adds up. Thank you for being patient with me through this time. And now, without any further ado, the Game Show Junkie. Hi, I'm Brian, and I'm a Game Show Junkie. Throughout the 80 years of the genre, there have been many constant props. There was the big wheel, playing cards, and dice. In the 1970s, dice became the new popular prop with shows like The Big Showdown, and today's topic, High Rollers! High Rollers began on NBC in 1974 with the man who would eventually have all the answers, Alex Trebek. The object was to answer toss-up questions, roll the oversized dice, and eliminate nine numbers from a board opposite to them. Each number hit a prize from cash to two halves of a big prize. In 1976, the game was changed to where the numbers housed a picture of a famous face. The first to identify the face won the round. In April of 1978, the show reverted back to its classic format. Because the 1978 version was virtually identical to the 1987 version, I will describe the format using the 1987 version. If you're ready, run me like the numbers, roll me like the dice! Two contestants answered toss-up questions to gain control of oversized dice. The dice were used to knock off numbers 1 to 9 on a game board. Each column of the board housed prizes and sometimes cash. The numbers could line up on the board in any order. One of the columns was labeled the hot column, meaning one roll of the dice could knock off all the numbers in that column. To complete a column, a player had to eliminate numbers by using any combination of the number rolled. If no move was possible, the player loses. Any prizes captured by clearing columns was only won if that player won the game. Control of the dice was also important because it gave the player the option of passing the dice to their opponent when the number of available moves was dwindling. The only thing that could save a player from a bad roll was a double. Any time a double was rolled, the player was given an insurance marker. If they threw a number that couldn't be made, the marker would give them a free roll. The game was played as a best two out of three game match. The first person to win the match went to the bonus game for $10,000 in cash. The bonus game was called the Big Numbers. The winner keeps rolling as long as they can remove numbers from the board. Each number knocked off netted them $100, but knocking off all nine numbers got them the grand prize of $10,000. Although it sounds like a simple game, it's one of the hardest bonus games to beat. Many players came close, but left the stage without winning $10,000. As mentioned before, this version was identical to the 1978 version of the show, but they took it one step further and added many games. Available every other couple of games were special mini-games that could be played for usually a brand new car! There were many used throughout the one-year run, but a lot of them were one roll and it's over. Here's a list of my personal top five high rollers mini-games. Number five, Around the World. Although it's one of those one roll and done games, it had a more specific goal than the others. Numbers 1 through 5 rolled would give a vacation to a destination, but if 6 was rolled, they would win a trip around the world. Not a bad prize for one roll of a single die. Number 4, 
Driver's Test. This one was laid out like a board game. In six rolls of a single die or less, the player had to move the car from the start and park it in the finish. The twist to this game was if the contestant overshot the finish line, the next roll would move them backwards, like parallel parking. If they hit the finish line exactly, they passed the test and won the car. Number 3. Love Letters A six-letter word is hidden, and the player has six rolls to get the word. Whatever number was thrown, that letter would be revealed. After six rolls, they had ten seconds to guess the word. If they got it, they won the car. If not, they got $100 for each letter revealed. Number two, it takes two. This was as close to a craps game as you can get. Six prizes are up for grabs represented by the numbers one through six. The player kept rolling one die until they repeated a number. Whatever number was repeated was the prize they got. This means the game could have as many as seven rolls of one die. Number one, Dice Derby. The top spot goes to the high rollers horse race, Dice Derby. The player rolls one die until one of the racehorses crosses the finish line. The horses are named odd and even. Therefore, a two, four, or six makes the even horse move, and one, three, or five makes the odd horse move. If odd wins, the player wins $1,000, but the even horse will net the player a new car! The game is as tense as the main game, but simple. <laughs> Set designer Jim Newtown created the two sets of Alex Trebek's version to resemble a Las Vegas casino. In fact, the original version went as far as to have a dice stick similar to ones used at a craps table. During the new version, a new table was constructed housing a magic carpet, which brought the dice back to the players automatically, thus eliminating the need for a stick person. For the 1987 edition, Anthony Sabatino and William H. Harris kept the Las Vegas feel, but modernized it. For many shows in the 1980s, a set needed a ton of blinking lights. On this set, Anything you can think of has blinking lights surrounding it. Even the legs on the dice table. Another important visual was the insurance marker. On Alex's version, the markers were plastic rectangles and laid next to the player, so it wasn't easy to tell how many a player had. This version's markers were shiny squares and placed in a slit in front of the player, which was easier to keep an eye on. But the two crucial visuals were the ones differentiating the main game from the bonus game. They were the big numbers and the golden dice. When they say you're going to play the big numbers, they aren't kidding. The numbers were lined up 1 to 9 at center stage and were so massive they needed one camera shot locked onto it with a wide angle lens to capture the whole board. Not only were the golden dice shiny and attention grabbing, but they also sounded like they were heavier than the white dice. It made you feel like you were playing with very special props. The host of High Rollers 1987 was the king of all hosts, Wink Martindale. After seven successful seasons on Tic Tac Doe and hosting his own creation Headline Chasers, Wink was at the helm of another high stakes and high energy game. You could tell Wink was a craps fan. His commentary of the roles mimicked that of a stick man at a craps table. Due to high odds against somebody winning the big numbers, Wink was extra excited when somebody did win the $10,000. Another nine for ten thousand dollars. A nine. 
He did it! He did it! Ten thousand dollars! A big nine! The theme to High Rollers was recycled from an unsold pilot titled Lucky Numbers. Since the show was created as a High Rollers clone, even having Alex Trebek as the host, Merrill Heater decided to use Stanworth's high-energy theme for High Rollers. It kind of fits like a glove. Beginning of each round, the numbers line up on the board with this beauty. The buzzer was an extended sound since the lights extend up the entire half of the table. In case you didn't hear Wink say a person rolled a double, they created a jingle for that. Oh, yeah! Three, one. So the audience knows for sure the contestant lost on a bad roll. There's a sound for that. The win cues for winning the round and winning the match are slightly different, but different enough that the music wouldn't be redundant. Game goes to Hugh, and we've got an even match at a game of peace. <laughs> Instead of an annoying buzzer or school bell to alert the player's time was up for the day, the time's up bell was actually tolerable. Brand new match underway, shall In fact, let's not get a new match underway because the bell means we're out of time. In case Wink's excited voice wasn't enough to prove $10,000 was won, they did have a win cue for the big numbers. No! Oh my God! Oh my God! But the best sound effect was the sound of the dice rolling across the table. Possibly because after playing lots of board games, dice sound more satisfying rolling across felt than across cardboard. Once again, the opening from Wink each day gave the catchphrase for high rollers. Take it away, Wink. Skill, strategy, sabotage, and these unpredictable dice. That's right. The catchphrase describes the game takes skill of rolling the dice, plus the strategy and sabotage of passing the dice at the opportune moment. That's High Rollers, an addicting game of numbers and luck. I do believe it's time for a reboot of this format as well. The most important thing to do is to get a high-energy host. A host that's energetic enough but not obnoxious like Leslie Jones. Get out! Did you hear that? Yes, ma'am. This is Brian, your game show junkie, saying, help!